It's August 6th, 1988, and this is the night it all ended. It's getting late, and all Jane Borowski wants is a cold drink, yet the vendors at the Cheshire Fairground had closed for the evening. Jane is only 22 years old, but seven months pregnant and uncomfortable in the sticky heat of late summer. She finds her car parked in a field, a white Pontiac Firebird. Her boyfriend Dennis had bought it for her, and Jane loves her car. She thinks it's the best present anyone's ever given her. As she drives from Keene toward Swansea in central New Hampshire, Jane turns up the radio. Jane spots the fluorescent glow of Gamarlo's Market. The store is closed, but Jane knows there's a vending machine outside. So she pulls into the parking lot, digs around for some change, and purchases a soda. As she settles back into her Firebird and takes a sip, Jane notices a pair of headlights cut through the night. An older model Jeep Wagoneer pulls into Gamarlo's parking lot and parks right next to Jane on her passenger side. She pays it little mind. But strangely, the man gets out of his truck and, instead of walking toward the vending machine or payphone, crosses behind Jane's car. He comes to her window and leans down. Is the payphone working? He asks. But before Jane can answer, he opens her car door. He tries to pull her out. Jane struggles fiercely against him and somehow kicks upward as hard as she can. Her windshield shatters. The man leans into the car and presses a knife against her throat, its blade cool against her skin. Jane eases herself out of her car. You beat up my girlfriend, he says, bizarrely. Jane is confused. She never beat up anyone's girlfriend, and says as much. Aren't these Massachusetts plates, he asks. Jane shakes her head as he walks to the back of her car and looks at the New Hampshire plates. Then he turns back to his own car, Jane can't believe it. Relief floods through her, but then she looks at her prized firebird. Here's the thing you need to know about Jane Borowski. She's a fighter. And she's not going to take anyone's bullshit. Hey, asshole, she calls to him. What about my windshield? The man stalks back to Jane and threatens her with the knife again. Miraculously, Jane sees another car coming down the road and sees her chance. She breaks away, running toward the road, screaming wildly for help, but the car doesn't stop, doesn't see her, doesn't hear her. And then Jane is hit like a truck from behind as the man takes her to the ground. He straddles Jane and her pregnant belly and sinks the knife into her body over and over and over again. And Jane fights not just for her own life, but for the life of her unborn baby. And just as suddenly as it all started, he stops. The man calmly gets up and walks back to his truck. He pulls up to where Jane still lays on the ground. From the driver's window, he stares down on the woman he had just stabbed 27 times as the blood begins to pool around her body. It is a long, cold stare. There is no expression, no feeling at all for what he had just done. Then he guns the car out of the parking lot, leaving Jane Borowski to die alone, clutching her pregnant belly. My name is Jane Borowski. I survived, and I remember everything. You're listening to Dark Valley, an investigative series from Crawl Space Media and Glassbox Media. I'm your host, Jennifer Amell. This is episode one. Thank you.
Dark Valley is possible because you listen. Be an advocate for these cases by rating and reviewing Dark Valley. It really does make a difference. Episodes are released weekly, but if you want to binge the first seven episodes, sign up for a subscription show on Apple Podcasts and get exclusive access to bonus content. I had no idea what to expect from Jane Borowski. I knew that her story of survival was incredible. Miraculous, even. Her survival made her powerful. Somehow stronger than the rest of us. Larger than life itself. Jane and I finally meet in a rundown motel in Keene, New Hampshire, just miles from Gamarlo's store, where she was almost murdered 34 years ago. It's summer in New England, and the room is stuffy. All right, tell me your favorite joke. <laughs> My favorite joke is we set up a microphone on the ironing board. <laughs> we are in a beautiful day's in. <laughs> With bedspreads that say, Welcome, sunshine. <laughs> it's such a happy place. <laughs> okay, I mean, it seems to. The levels are good. Um, unfortunately, you're going to have Jane is, of off. course, a survivor, but she's also warm and quick to laugh. She lives modestly and gives freely. She loves her family. She's also a spitfire and sassy as hell. She smokes cigarettes with her arms crossed and blows smoke from the corner of her mouth. But more than anything, Jane is honest. She would say it took a lot to be so open, that she had to go through many dark years, overshadowed by that night in August of 1988. But here she is, in this shitty motel room, wearing a hot pink t-shirt and smiling so wide that it makes her eyes even bluer. You got that smile on your face. (laughs) Oh, I'm I'm smiling because I'm excited to ask this question because I... Oh, what's that? I want to know about your childhood. Oh, my childhood. Well, my parents divorced when I was very young. We lived in Massachusetts. My dad lived in Hinsdale, New Hampshire, where I live now. And I saw my dad probably two or three times a year. We'd come up for school vacations and, and spend the week with him. And my mom moved us around a lot. When I turned 18, I decided to go to Hinsdale to visit my dad and spend more time with my dad. And I had some really good friends that lived in Hinsdale because I saw them every summer and uh, and just always stayed friends with them. So I stayed with one of my good friends and um, that summer and I ended up um, meeting Dennis. And so my visit turned into I still live in Hinsdale 36 years later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. It's beautiful here. Yeah, it is. A playground where steep mountains stand on end beside roads that are ideal for riding, where golf courses are surrounded by a countryside famed in song and story. The truth is... The Connecticut River Valley is beautiful, and if it weren't for the tragedies that happened here, I'd say this place is almost idyllic. We're technically in the Upper Valley, the borderland between New Hampshire and Vermont, which is bisected by the Connecticut River. The river is wide and blue, and there's so many bridges that stretch across to connect the small towns between the states. In the summer, the valley is so lush that I have a hard time registering that many shades of green. In fact, This land is the Northeast's most productive farmland. Jane's husband, Dennis, comes from a farming family himself, and now they live together on that land that they've worked for generations. Winters, on the other hand, are harsh. But the people here take pride in weathering the cold. It kind of makes them who they are. As I look over there, I can see Mount Mananoc. Mount Mananoc? Mount Mananoc. Have you been to the top of that mountain? I have twice. It was hard. (laughs) <laughs> it's intense. It was hard. <laughs> it was like a three-hour hike up. The Connecticut Valley pretty much separates Vermont and New Hampshire. It goes, it goes right up the border of Vermont and New Hampshire. 
when you get a fishing license, I think the Connecticut River is the only river you can fish with a Vermont or a New Hampshire license. It, even if you're on like Vermont side of the river, I believe you can still fish with a New Hampshire license because the river totally borders New Hampshire and Vermont. The roads that weave through the valley are full of potholes from harsh winters and sometimes unpaved the further you get from the interstate. Before the 1970s, country life moved at an expected pace, measured out by the growing seasons and the snow seasons, planting rye or tapping the maples to sugar. Before the construction of interstate highways, the valley was isolated. By 1978, Interstate 91 was completed, and the Connecticut River Valley changed forever. The highway made it easier to get to the valley, and it of course sparked the valley's tourism economy, but also brought new types of people, and with them, new types of crime. In fact, there is a definitive date you can point to when the valley became, and pardon the cheap illusion, darker. Catherine, or Kathy, was only 26 in 1978. She was an avid birder, meaning someone who enjoys nature by donning a pair of wellingtons and binoculars and going out to observe and catalog different species of birds. Kathy had long auburn hair with pale skin and a thin face. In the only picture that exists of her on the internet, Kathy is dressed in this super 60s floral print that looks vaguely inspired by Renaissance fashion. She is shoulder to shoulder with what looks like to be a man in a brown corduroy jacket, but the rest of him is cut off, and she's holding a tall, tapered white candle. The photo has an eerie effect. Kathy worked for a local publishing company in Wilmot, New Hampshire, which is about 45 minutes east of the Connecticut River. On October 24th of 1978, Kathy ventured out to the Chandler Brook Wetland Preserve in nearby New London. She had gone to photograph birds in the nature preserve. As Kathy was innocently scanning the skies and treetops, someone was also watching her. Kathy never made it home that evening. The next day, her body was discovered only yards from where she had been photographing. She had been stabbed over 20 times, with wounds to her upper chest and neck. It was a vicious attack, but sloppy. The assailant did not take any pains to hide or remove the body. It seems Kathy was left where she was killed. On August 28th of 1979, a 13-year-old girl named Sherry Nastasia disappeared from Springfield after a witness reported seeing her getting into a dark green vehicle with an unknown man. Her skeletal remains were found three months later by a trucker near a rest stop in Rockingham. She had likely been stabbed to death. And then, on August 31st of 1981, 12-year-old Teresa Fenton was abducted while riding her bike in Springfield. Authorities managed to find her in a wooded area along the banks of the Connecticut River, half buried and left to die after being viciously beaten. She later died from her injuries at the Mary Hitchcock Memorial Hospital in Hanover, New Hampshire. And then again, on April 9th of 1983, a little girl named Katie Richards was abducted while walking with her friend Rachel on a road in Springfield. Her body was also found in the woods. She had been sexually assaulted and beaten to death. They didn't have a word for it yet, but by this point the police realized that these child murders were connected and were likely perpetrated by the same assailant. The term serial killer was just coming into the public consciousness with the media frenzy over the crimes of Ted Bundy, Larry Eiler, Joseph Christopher, and Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. But that's what the Valley had, a serial killer. Authorities needed to act quickly if they were going to catch the person who murdered Kathy, Sherry, Teresa, and Katie, and before he killed again. Also new in the evolution of investigatory technique was the field of criminal profiling, 
In 1986, Douglas and Burgess published in the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin that the, quote, criminal profiling process is defined by the FBI as a technique used to identify the perpetrator of a violent crime by identifying the personality and behavioral characteristics of the offender based upon an analysis of the crime committed. Enter Dr. John Philpin, a man I have come to deeply respect. John is a psychologist and was instrumental in developing the profile of the man who committed these child murders in the valley in the 1970s. John is protective of Jane and deeply distrustful of true crime, especially as entertainment. So I've made it my mission to try and earn John's trust. This meeting is being recorded. All right, John, I'd love if you would introduce yourself. My name is John Philpin. I'm feeling like it's taken several lifetimes to get to this point where you're here on the Zoom talking to me. What made you decide to go on the record? Well, the main thing is um, there are, I think, many more cases that remain cold cases. And uh, in one of our conversations, it was pretty clear to me that your intent was to get some information out that might uh, provoke some responses of uh, information that would uh, contribute to various investigations. Now, first of all, I, I, I want to say that I, from day one, I have loathed the title of profiler. I don't think that's what I do at all. The FBI essentially took off you know, from that concept and marketed the word. I was starting my work uh, right about the same time they were. Uh, that was when I decided that I had to come up with my own approach. A game that uh, I used to play with my office manager, she would be reading some newspaper article of uh, some atrocity and I would tell her, if they catch this guy, this is what he's going to be like. But she would write down what I said and kind of tuck it away. And then if the guy was caught, she'd rip it back out and we'd look at it. And more often than not, I was right on the money. Then uh, right about that time, we had a local murder. My office was in Springfield. Vermont, um, we had a local murder, uh, Teresa Fenton. It was a brutal homicide. But my office manager's reaction was, um, how can these things happen around here? Which is a common enough reaction. Things like this can't happen here. Well, we've all learned the lesson that they can and they do, and often repeatedly. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. Just after the death of Katie Richards in 1983, a Springfield local came forward with a story. He said he was driving to church and saw two girls walking along the road who matched the description of Katie and her friend Rachel. It was the same day he met a new churchgoer, a man by the name of Gary Schaefer. Gary left the service early that day, claiming to be ill. Gary also looked a lot like the man Rachel had described, the one who abducted Katie. Police quickly caught up to Gary and he said he had gone to Rutland, Vermont with a friend. But upon talking to Gary's mother and the friend, it turned out that Gary's alibi for that day didn't check out. He had lied. Police arrested him on the charge of Katie Richards' murder. Gary later confessed to the murder of Katie, and later he was charged with the murder of Teresa Fenton. He also pled guilty to the kidnapping of another girl, Deanna Buxton, who managed to escape the terrifying ordeal with her life. 
And while no charges were ever filed against Gary Schaefer for the murder of Sherry Nastasia, it is strongly believed by law enforcement that he is responsible for her death as well. Dr. Philpin's earlier profile of the killer was eerily spot on. His crimes were motivated by sexual predation of adolescent girls. Gary Schaefer is serving a 30-year-to-life sentence, plus 15 to 20 years for second-degree murder, kidnapping, and sexual assault. As of this recording, Gary Schaefer is still in custody. But what about Kathy Milligan? the 26-year-old who was brutally stabbed to death in the wetland preserve. Schaefer never confessed to her murder. She was too old to be the type of victim Gary sought after. To authorities at the time, it seemed as if Kathy Milliken was a tragic murder, but nonetheless an anomaly, unconnected to Gary Schaefer's reign of terror against the Valley's children. So, you might be wondering what all this has to do with Jane and her attack in 1988. Here she is. I had just gotten out of the hospital, and of course, everybody around me was like, like when I was in the hospital, they didn't want me to see the news because I was on the news. They didn't want the newspapers to be brought into my room because they didn't want me to read the news. So, back in 1988, Weeks after her attack, Jane finally gets her hands on a local paper. I happened to be reading the newspaper, and I saw that it was the article about me. Um, I think it was something like, the headline was something like, uh, stabbing victim released from hospital. Or, or I have to whatever. interrupt so Jane started- here for a little sidebar story. One day, Jane and I ventured to the library to do some archival research together. But they didn't take long. Oh, yeah. This is the one. I think this was the very first article I read. Yep, this was when I was released. That's the one I saw. Okay. Can you read the title? It says, Stabbing Victim is Released from Keene Hospital. So I started reading it. It had said something about uh, maybe connected to the Connecticut River Valley serial killer. And it's like, Connecticut River Valley serial killer. And then I started reading, and they had a, a brief description of each victim. And I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was like, are you kidding me? I had a hard time processing this. Um, I'm reading in the paper, you know, Ellen Freed, she went missing this date, and then they found her remains on this date. And then each one I read, it wasn't, and none of them were survivors. They were all murdered. Jane's attacker didn't start with her. Jane is thought to be the only survivor of a serial killer who prowled the Connecticut River Valley between 1978 and 1988 and killed at least eight other women. He is known as the Valley Killer. And up until this point, the women he killed have only been known by their brutal deaths. The Valley Killer has never been caught and Jane's attack, along with the murders of these eight women, remain unsolved to this day. No, Jane's attacker didn't start with her, but he certainly ended with her. Since August of 1988, no other murder or attack in this area has been linked to the same man. By the mid-80s, Dr. Philpin was invited into the investigation by the New Hampshire and Vermont State Police. 
And his process is a little different than most. I was suspending my own senses of logic, morality, and bringing him into my mind. And being him as often as I, I needed to be. And then in 1988, when Jane was released from the hospital, the New Hampshire State Police decided to have Dr. Philpin clinically hypnotize her in hopes of recovering more details of her attack. There was only one time that I, I confronted that. It, it was uh, pretty terrifying, but I, I was aware of what had happened. I had been filled in on, on all the details because there was a, a feeling that Jane's case might be tied to some of the other cases that had been happening in the valley. When Jane came in, uh, she was nervous, of course. She, it was something she agreed to do, but at the same time, it was a little scary, I assume. When she came to the office the first time, she's a very sweet person, as you well know. She came in and, and was a little nervous and sat down and uh, we just chatted at first. You know, the main thing I wanted to do was, was a reassurance, reassurance kind of thing so that she could feel like uh, it was okay to be where she was. And, and I explained the process to her somewhere along the way in there. I noticed the scars on her throat. And I remember thinking, you know, how, how did this nice young woman get those horrible scars on her throat? And what hit me was, I did it. The little bit that I had, had spent thinking about the case involved bringing the perp into my head. Um, and I think by that time I'd already been down to, to the market uh, one time and scared the crap out of somebody who was getting a soda at midnight. But, but that was what hit me was, you know, I did it. And it was like I, I had to snap out of it, believing, you know, that I had done it. And uh, for that whole week until I saw her again, I, I had uh, nightmares, disturbed sleep, uh, headaches. Um, it was probably the, the most uh, profound negative reaction that I had in all the years that I was doing this. And it was mainly because I, I was me and I wanted to help, but I was also the bad guy. And that was one of the liabilities that I learned at that time of bringing this fellow, whoever he happened to be, whatever case it happened to be, inside me, uh, instead of uh, pretending that I was inside his head. Uh, it was a pretty horrible experience. So here's what we know. The Valley Killer's victims are believed to be connected by a few salient characteristics. The murders before Jane escalated in the 1980s and were relegated to the upper Connecticut River Valley along the I-91 corridor, with core cases situated near the town of Claremont, New Hampshire, on Route 12. Each young woman killed was in a vulnerable situation. Those whose remains were found early enough had been killed by a frenzied and vicious attack. They were stabbed with a knife in a V-shaped pattern in their chests and abdomens, and nearly all suffered a severed jugular vein in their necks. Whether or not there was only one valley killer, 
two or several Valley killers is hotly debated. Among original and current law enforcement, Dr. Philpin, the original profiler, locals to the area, and the victims' families alike. You know, the detectives absolutely believe that, that whoever attacked me is the one that killed them. It's hard to, yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what happens here, but yeah, definitely, uh, yeah, hers had blood spray and it sounded very like Jane's, you know, stabs would go in for the throat. But they were not forthcoming at all with us, the family. And like I said, the former police chief at the time, we believed that she had just taken her off. Jane herself is not even wholly convinced that her attack is connected to those women killed in Claremont, a mere 40 miles up the road. She strongly believes that it is. But it's important to say explicitly that it is not confirmed that all these cases were perpetrated by the same individual. In order to make any headway in this investigation, you have to keep an open mind. I began this project with all the gusto and enthusiasm of any true crime podcaster or investigative journalist. I wanted answers. I wanted to know who did it. I wanted justice for Jane and for all of the other women. But in getting to know Jane, I realized that this story is about something much more important than all that. In fact, there was this incredible moment in the library in Claremont when Jane and I were reading through the archives that's become something of a touchstone for me. We were going on hour three in the stacks when the librarian came over to check on us. So if you solved the murder, you? Pretty much. <laughs> Not doing it to solve it. <laughs> you can probably hear my nervous laughter. And I think it's because I was just reminded of why we're doing all this in the first place. It's not necessarily to punish someone or to seek vengeance. It's not even for some vague sense of justice. It's so that these women, these eight women, are remembered beyond the facts of their horrific deaths. And that may sound trite, but it's my earnest conviction. And I have Jane to thank for the constant reminders and bringing me back to center. So, will we solve a serial killer case? I don't know. Maybe we will. But maybe it's not the most important thing. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. I wanted to record why you decided to do this pro- Like, why now? Like, why did you say yes to me? Because you asked. <laughs> Is it just because I asked? No, it's because nobody has really, nobody has really told the real story of the Connecticut River Valley murders. Nobody has told my story in a correct way. Jane, what's your mission with this? You know, I was thinking about that the other night and uh, I was thinking, what do I expect to com come from this, come out of this? And I mean, the fact of the matter is, maybe we'll find answers to some un unanswered questions that, that I have. We may find more questions. <laughs> and, um, you know, I have a lot of questions. I wanna be a voice for those victims. If I could talk to them today, I would tell them how sorry I am. I'm sorry that they passed away so young. I'm sorry that they had to experience such fear and terror before they passed. I'm sorry that monster's face is the last face they had to see before they passed away. And I'm sorry that their families had to and have to endure so much pain with their loss. But sometimes it's hard for me to think that, my God, you know, I survived what they also endured. And it's, it's hard sometimes. 
It's, I ask myself all the time, why did I survive and they didn't? They call it survivor's guilt. And it is a very real thing. I don't know who these women were, but I know that they were doing the exact same thing I was doing before they were murdered. They were just living their lives. And what compelled you to want to find out about these other women? I wanted to, I wanted, I, for myself personally, I wanted to know, okay, what was the connection between them and me? Their case and my case. I just felt like I just needed to know more about what happened to them. And, and I, I, I needed to know, I just wanted to know, you know, how, how were they picked up? Um, how were they abducted? Or when did they go missing? Or where did they go missing from? And, and where were they found? And I, I just, for some reason, I just wanted to know what happened to them and how was it connected to what happened to me? Um, I guess it was, I needed to confirm. I needed to confirm exactly, you know, the comparison between me and them, mm -hmm. their case and my case. Do you think to better understand what happened to you? I don't know. I don't know. I have so many questions still. Even, I mean, it's been 33 years, and I still have so many questions, you know. I know that there are questions I probably will never get answered. Um, you know, somebody had asked me one time, if they ever found out who did this to you, would you want to talk to them? Absolutely, absolutely. I would love to sit down and ask him so many questions. You know, why did you do this to me? Did you follow me? Was I just a victim of opportunity? What happened to you in your life where you would want to go out and kill a woman? Why, what happened to you in your life why you would want to stab, attack and stab a pregnant woman knowing she's pregnant? Um, what did you do after? Did you drive home and eat supper? Did you drive home and take a shower? Because I know you had blood on you. Um, you know, were you scared that you were going to get caught? Um, you know, were you watching the news after my attack? And were you aware at that time that I was still alive? Were you thinking about coming back and attacking me? Did you, did you see me after that without me knowing? I mean, I have so many questions, so many questions. I, I would love to sit and talk face to face with him. Stories are important. Stories can change minds, change culture, policy, can change lives. So I think what Jane is communicating is that through telling her own story and the stories of the other women, she wants some kind of change to occur. But it's a jumbled, confusing story, a 40-plus year investigation that is carried on in fits and starts over time. These cases have been shuffled from generation to generation of investigators, from agency to agency. Memories have faded, people have died, and the wilderness has reclaimed these soiled sites along the Connecticut River like it would any other dead thing. These women were strangers in life, and who in death are connected in some kind of perverse galaxy. And Jane, speaking like a woman possessed, trying to strain her ear beyond the veil, and hear these women speaking. Kathy, Betsy, Bernice, Eva, Ellen, Linda, Heidi, and Barbara. Jane and I traveled the roads these women were taken from, tripped and crawled through the dense wilds where their bodies were abandoned, tried to see these places through these women's eyes, 
tried to imagine the fear and the fight. I have spoken to the families and friends of these women and learned that there are more ways to grieve than I ever imagined. Where do we even start? If we did have to choose a beginning, it would be a couple years before Gary Schaefer was caught. Kathy Milliken's 1978 murder had receded in public consciousness like a fading nightmare. That was until the late summer of 1981, when the body of a missing woman turned up in the woods of Unity, New Hampshire. With hindsight, we know it could not have been Gary Schaefer. It wasn't his M.O. She was again too old, too far removed from his hunting grounds. And when authorities finally caught up with Schaefer, he never confessed to the murder of any adult women. Who was this woman? Who had killed her? The Connecticut River Valley now had to reckon with not one, but two serial killers. So, let's begin. Next time on Dark Valley, Jane and I venture into the woods to investigate the Valley Killer's first potential victim, and one small detail might break these cases wide open. Dark Valley is produced, written, and edited by me, Jennifer Amell. It's also made possible by executive producers with Crawl Space Media, Tim Polari, and Lance Reinsterna. Follow us on social, at Dark Valley Show. Production assistants include Amanda Bedard and Marianne Stone White. Show art by Pamela Robinson. Original theme song by Jennifer Paig. Please see the show notes for additional music credits, courtesy of Pixabay. And if you have a tip for any of these cases, please call the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663 or the Vermont State Police Major Crimes Unit at 802-244-8781 or you can write to us at darkvalleyshow at gmail.com. Until next time. <laughs>